So, what are we up to today? We're covering the oil record book. But they can't see it. I'll fix that. <laughs> Clever. So what's it about? Before I tell you what it's about, let's be clear what it's for. It's for proof and protection. The information we record in here proves that we've handled oil and oily waste properly on board and protects us against any suggestion we may have broken the law. So it's all about keeping inspectors happy? There's more to it than that. It's about taking pride in our jobs as engineers, being systematic, following correct procedures, using equipment properly, dealing with oily waste and sludge before it becomes a problem. Do all ships have this record? All ships over 400 gross tons, with one big difference, oil tankers. For them, it starts at 150 gross tons, and their deck officer has to complete part two of the book, which covers cargo and ballast operations. As you can see, the obvious information is on the outside of the book. The name of the ship its distinctive letters or numbers, its IMO ID number and gross tonnage, and the period covered by the book. And inside? Inside, we build up a complete day-by-day -day and sometimes hour-by-hour -hour record of how we've handled oil and oily waste. The records show where and when we've bunkered fuel and bulk lube oil and the tanks in which that's been stored when we ballast or clean oil field tanks, and when we discharge dirty ballast or cleaning water, we record precisely what we have done. We show the quantity of the sludge we've produced, the tanks in which it's been stored, and how we have disposed of it. You mean by incineration? Or discharging it ashore, or moving it from one tank to another. We also record what we've done with bilge water, the quantities we've discharged overboard, or pumped ashore, or stored in slop tanks, and where and when we've used the separator. And problems with the equipment? That as well. If our discharge monitoring and control systems fail, that has to be recorded. That's quite a list. It is, but you don't have to remember it. There are eight sections, and they're listed in the front of every oil record book. Of course, for each one of these, there are specific bits of information that have to be recorded. We'll talk about what they are in a moment. But before we do, have a look at section G. Accidental or exceptional discharges. What's an exceptional discharge? That's when we deliberately pump oil or oily water that hasn't been through the separator into the sea. Why would we do that, do you think? Because we're curious to see the inside of a jail. Come on, seriously. Some kind of emergency. Right. If the ship's in danger, or to save someone's life. It sounds a bit extreme. It is. This is a last resort in a real emergency. And if it happens, the authorities will need to be convinced that it was justified. When the book asks you to record the circumstances, reasons and general remarks, that means a full description, backed up by the ship's log and whatever other information is relevant. Don't worry, if you're lucky, you'll go through your whole career without having to do this. Has that ever happened to you? Once, years ago, on another ship, the stern gland blew in at sea. Until we could repack the gland, we needed every pump we had to pump the water coming in back overboard. That sounds like a busy watch. That's one way to describe it. Once is enough. <laughs> we'll look at what has to be entered in a moment. But first, and very important, timing. When you're operating the separator, you must make note of every piece of information you need. Times, tank soundings, whatever, as you collect it. So we don't forget and make mistakes. Exactly. It's better to use a notebook rather than loose bits of paper. 
Then, as soon as you've completed the operation, go to the control room or wherever you keep the record book and use your notes to complete the official record. Don't leave it till later. Now for the details. Choose a section. OK. Um, how about discharging bilge water overboard through the separator? That's D, isn't it? That's right. When an engineer is operating the separator, what sort of information do you think he'll need to record? Start and finish times. Yes, and? The bilge holding tank soundings. Exactly. We've got to be able to calculate and record the exact quantity we discharge overboard. So we sound the tank before we start and after we finish. And this ship has a separate oily bilge tank to take discharges over 15 parts per million. So we record before and after soundings for that as well. We also keep a dips book. We do a daily dip of the double bottoms and the duty engineer signs it. That's not a regulation. No, but it's good practice. Every ship in this company's fleet keeps one. So, what's in the record book? As you can see, it's exactly what common sense suggests. How much we discharged, how long it took, and where it went. Now, let's look at how to enter the information. Here's a blank record page. After the date, come the code letter and the item number. In this case, the code letter is D, and the first item number is 13. So that's the first entry, the quantity. And in this case, there are two more. Do we always use capital letters? Always. Most engineers are like doctors. No one can read our writing. And notice as well that the entries are in ink, never pencil. So they can't be altered? Correct. That's for your protection. No one can change what you've written. And when you've completed the entry, sign and date it. What if I make a mistake? You cross out what you have written using a single line like this. Don't use Tipex or an eraser. It's very important that the mistake can still be read. Then you sign and date it and put the correct entry below, like this. Here's something else we mustn't do. Leave blank lines in the record. And every page has to be signed by the master. Incidentally, though this isn't a regulation, some companies require the chief to sign as well. So it's all pretty straightforward. We look in the front of the book to check precisely what we're supposed to record for whatever we're doing, write it down, sign it. Is that it? Yes, but we have to get the details right. Look at this entry again. We have to record where the ship is because the regulations say when we're discharging oily water, the ship has to be underway en route, so that we're spreading the stuff out and not dumping it in one place. So, recording the position of the ship isn't to do with special areas? No, but that's a good question. What do you know about special areas? Well, they're defined in MARPOL. They're areas of the ocean that have fragile environments, like um, shallow landlocked seas and the uh, cold waters of the Antarctic and so on. Are we allowed to discharge bilge water in these areas? Not in the Antarctic, but we can in all other special areas, so long as we stick within the 15 parts per million limit. So, apart from the Antarctic, there's no difference in how we discharge inside or outside the areas? Not in how we discharge. The difference is in the equipment we've got to have. Outside the areas, only ships over 10,000 tonnes have to have the bilge alarm and an automatic cutoff which prevents discharge above 15 parts per million. Inside the areas, it's all ships above 400 tonnes. You remember I said there was a part two of the book? Is that the one deck officers have to complete on oil tankers? Spot on. 
you have to make sure that the records of transfers are consistent between both parts of the book. You mean transfers from engine room sludge tanks to slop tanks? Correct. And there are a couple of other things to watch out for. First, the connection between engine room and deck must comply with class rules. It must have non-return valves and a removable section of piping. No flexi hoses in case the burst causes pollution. We don't want cargo or vapours getting back into the engine room. And the method of transfer must be listed on the IOPP Form A. Why do you think that matters? Port state control? They don't trust pipes that don't officially exist. And the problem is made worse because of the relative sizes of the tanks. 20 cubic meters of sludge transferred to a VLCC slop tank will hardly affect the tank level. It'll look as if the sludge has disappeared. So port state control may want to see the IOPP documents. That reminds me of something else that's important. Names. Names? When you're filling in the record book, you have to be careful to use the tank descriptions from the IOPP Form A. Don't call a waste oil tank a holding tank if that's not how it's listed on the form. Here's another detail. Look at this entry. It's about disposing of sludge ashore. There's something missing. Can you see what it is? Uh, not really. Can I check the list? Of course. Always check the list if you're unsure. Hmm. Let's have a look. C, 12.1, to reception facilities. That'll be New York, so done that. <laughs> of course. Get a receipt. That's it. It's so we can prove that this sludge went to the port facility and not over the side one dark night. We include the receipt number in the entry and file the actual receipt with the record book. You keep talking about proof. Is it the port state inspectors we have to convince? Well, remember what I said earlier. Even if there weren't inspectors, we'd still want to be able to show that we'd done our jobs properly. But to answer your question, yes. The inspector will want to see that we're keeping proper records. And importantly, that those records make sense. For example, look at this entry. Tank capacity, three cubic meters. How would an inspector know that information is correct? From the IOPP Form A. That's right. And look at this entry about discharge overboard through the separator. What do you think? The throughput looks very high. Nine cubic meters in one hour. Exactly. When the authorities see that, they'll want to check the throughput, not just on the IOPP certificate, but also against the manufacturer's manual and the type certificate. And if the maximum is five cubic meters an hour, they'll want an explanation. So we've also got to keep our manuals and certificates up to date. And sometimes they'll want to see our maintenance records as well. But as well as all of that, the numbers have to agree. As you can see, in this case, they don't. 74 tons of sludge have been produced. 50 tons have been incinerated. And 10 tons retained in the tank. This doesn't add up. An inspector is going to want to know, where are the other 14 tons? Where did they go? So that's about it. The oil record book. OK. Well, now, I know what this book's about and how to fill it in, but what about them? Thanks for the reminder. The oil record book is a complete record of how we handle oil and oily waste in the machinery spaces on board. Everything we do has to be recorded. It's not difficult. Just follow the instructions at the beginning of the book accurately. And as long as you've used the correct procedures and made the entries properly, you'll be fine. Don't forget, if anybody suggests you might have broken the law, it is these records that you've created that will protect you. <laughs>